after your first TED talk, is it a lot easier to get the next one? Kind of like when I was a kid and I was asking for sponsors, and as soon as I told someone that I, hey, this business said yes, maybe you ought to too, um, that, that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of mentioned how I went to the TED website, I contacted every event. I mean, I think I, the first batch I emailed about 300 people, and uh, finally one of them was crazy enough to say yes, and that was in uh, University of Washington. And then as soon as they said yes, I went back to all 299 other ones and said, by the way, these guys just said yes. And, um, and when I did that, two more said yes. And then, um, then whenever I submitted, I was like, hey, um, not only have I done a TED Talk before, but here's my TED Talk playlist. Go ahead and watch all of them. So it, it, it's certainly, once you build, build momentum, because it gives you credibility and, and people believe in that. Uh, and I think people like to invest in, in winners and those who, have, who are kind of have a, having that track record. So it definitely helps. Why an MBA? What was your motivation for that? Even though I dropped out of college when I came to Portland, uh, I eventually did go back and I, and I got a business management uh, degree. And I actually used the band, like I started the slants at the same time as I went back to, to get this undergrad degree in business management. And the band was like my business. Um, and it, so it seemed to make sense that an MBA is like a natural follow-up for that. Plus, I had already um, gotten into a career where I was working in marketing, so an, an MBA seemed like a good fit too. Um, the other part of like my reason for choosing Merrill Hurst and choosing to even go into uh, an MBA program in general was because I wanted to surround myself with people who had a drive, people who were entrepreneurial, people who wanted to get things done, and. You know, the working adults at Merrillhurst, I mean, while juggling families, a job, and school, those are the kind of people I want to be around. Those are the kind of people I wanted to know and associate myself with. So, uh, the MBA program I thought was a perfect fit for all of that. If you were to see somebody reading note cards and kind of shuffling through them a little bit, but then looking back up to the audience and speaking, and then looking back down, but then looking back up, or not at all, I'm just going, on. what's, tell me what looks more professional. Yeah, well, it's more professional. What's no note cards. No no, 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 no. It, it, it needs to feel yeah. conversational. As well, if you were having a conversation with the audience. You can have no Specifically on the TED points, they actually do have something like a rule book called the TED Commandments. And one of those rules is you're not allowed to use notes and you're not allowed to read off anything at all. Really? Um, there are exceptions to the rule. Monica Lewinsky did uh, an incredible talk and she was just, just so intimate and personal that she needed a stand and she had to read off it and they made that an exception. But generally speaking, I think a best practice is not to have anything between you and, and the audience. From the speaker's perspective, after the selection, do you get, is there a lot of interaction? Is there some kind of support? Or you just show up on the day and shazam? Oh, okay, so generally speaking, if you, if you do get selected, they assign a, a speaker coach and a committee to work with you. So you might have written out the best talk of your life and someone will go in there and probably tear it apart and say, I think you should do this instead, or they'll make some notes, or they'll ask you to expand on a certain point uh, on behalf of the committee. But generally speaking, it's, it's to help refine that. Um, I've, I've noticed that TED Talks kind of fall into almost two kind of categories. But overall, generally speaking, the most effective TED Talks out there are very intimate, personal stories that people give that make you feel like you're, you're wrapped in their particular world. The, there's a, the other type is like maybe a really, really good and short lecture. But people can hear lectures, they can read pop, you know, blogs and they can see podcasts all the time. Generally speaking, what they want to hear is your story. They want to see your journey. They want to see your failures, what you learn from it, and then they will make the connection in their own minds. Um, of course, there's definitely exceptions to the rule, but, um, but that's part of the, 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 the job of the speakers. Uh, committee to, to help you coach you through the process. Whether you're working with a really, really good um, speaker's coach or not, I would recommend practicing as much as possible, getting in front of as many people as possible, and allowing them to help, um, help you work through the process. So um, I wrote an article for Huffington Post about this, and it's just like seven tips on how to prepare for a TED Talk. And like I, I kind of have this formula myself where for every minute that your, your talk is going to be, practice an hour. So if, you're, if your talk is 10 minutes long, that's 10 hours of reading through, which that's, that's a lot, right? That's, that's 60 times that you're reading this thing through. Um, because the more you say it out loud, the more you hear yourself, 
the more you can think, rethink about that phrasing, maybe find better word choices, maybe you'll find quicker ways to get to your point, and, and so on. I'm just wondering, like, how do you decide, like, what's the most important thing about your story to share, and if you have a bunch of things that you want to share about your process or your experiences, like, how do you go about killing those puppies and taking the parts out that you don't think should stay? Like, what's that process like? So I always think that whatever you, whatever you imagine your, the length of your talk to be, like, probably think it's going to be 25% longer than that. Especially when you're delivering it, it's going to naturally be longer because of the pace of speaking, because of audience, audience reactions and that sort of thing. Um, so that, that, that's an important rule of thumb, generally speaking, whether you're doing a TED talk or any other kind of talk. Um, then as far as refining it, I, and this is something I struggle with all the time, like what stories should be there, what details should be there? And uh, something that one of my current coaches is telling me all the time is like, if this were the last talk you were to ever give in your life, and you only had this amount of time, then you'd be cut off, what would you keep? And um, so I was like, okay, the last thing I'd ever want to say or X, Y, and Z. And, and that's generally the stuff that you're going to be the most passionate about, and that comes through when you're speaking. So um, I'd maybe use that as kind of a guide too. Um, but also just kind of, also the more you speak to people, the more they can kind of help refine by saying, hey, you know, I really like this part, or I got lost in this particular story, and, or this is where I wanted to fall asleep in the middle of your talk, you know, <laughs> all those things. <laughs> I'm curious some of the surprises along your journey, some of the things that you didn't expect, some of the big takeaways, because you go for anything and everything you ever set your mind to. It's incredible. And I don't know that any of us could say that same thing. And I feel like all of us want to do our best, but you're kicking ass at life. <laughs> I fail all the time. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe surprises or yeah. like, if we wanted to be more like Simon, you know, what can you, uh, that's, there's no way you're gonna answer that <laughs> in that way, but um, I don't know, we're just all inspired by you. Give us a couple of morsels to. I mean, as far as like inspiration goes, I, I think a lot of it came down to having this mentor at the age of 13. I was, I was given this book called Developing the Leader Within You by John C. Maxwell. And, um, and I read it and I, and I just thought, there's so much more that, that I could be doing my, with my life. And so at that particular age, I was like, you know, I'm gonna read two books on leadership every month for the rest of my life. <laughs> so I created this leadership library. I started studying that uh, quite a bit. And I read a lot about sales and marketing and communications. And so that, that really helped shape a lot of those things. But as far as like the, the drive and everything else that I do, I, I just kind of tend to think of it as like, you know, I got possibly this, this my only chance to live life on Earth. I'm gonna try and make as much of an impact on other people as possible. And, and I, my, my life purpose, if I were to like draw it out, is to try and make the world a better place. So I try and think about how I can do that in, in different ways. Whether it's making the world a better place by having some really cool 80s dance rock music, which you guys can check out next month. Or um, whether it's giving these talks or writing materials, I, I just try and give to other people and, and try and do what that mentor did for me, which was like to realize that each of us has this incredible potential to, to do stuff. We just have to like keep at it and, and not be afraid to fail, to make mistakes or take risks. And can you talk about that, how you manage failure? So one of the things that I was told growing up is that a failure is an event, not a person. It's something that happens. But it's, it's also, is it truly a failure? You know, it, it, I think it is if you don't learn something along the way. Uh, kind of like the, the sponsorship asked when I was in seventh grade, like tech, by, by any measurement, it was kind of a failure. Like I didn't get all the stuff that I was hoping for. Actually, we did get some free concert tickets, but <laughs> like, you know, like I didn't get what I was hoping for and I could have just dwelt on that and like, oh, we, we, didn't, we didn't achieve this particular goal. But instead we decided to take lessons from it and, and say, how can I improve on this process and make it better? Um, there's a, actually another John Maxwell book called Failing Forward that talks a lot about um, outlining a, a healthy and productive um, process in dealing with failure, and, and I, I would highly recommend that. You talk about taking a risk <laughs> and going beyond the fear, and when I think about courage, I, I don't think about it being 
fear, I think about there being a higher value. So what is the higher value that is the light for you? Well, I think I, I try not to think about dwelling on things of like fear, other than maybe like spiders because they have way too many legs. <laughs> maybe more than four. I've got issues with it. But, um, <laughs> You know, generally speaking, I, I just try and think about the, the positive outcome, the impact. Like, what's going to happen if I'm successful at, at whatever I'm trying to do? Is it going to help out a community that's been marginalized? And if so, it's like, then then su succeeding is the only option, in my, in my opinion. Like, I will do everything it takes to get there, even if I feel uncomfortable with, with that particular situation. Um, so that, that's kind of, I guess, the, the light at the end of the tunnel or the... the the value for me is seeing somebody's life change in a positive way. Sharing your story with others to help them in one form or another, have you been able to see any tangible results following your TED talk? Being invited to the TED stage gives you a lot of credibility and um, it is great for like if you're looking for other speaking engagement opportunities. So because I've done several of them, especially on topics that I was deeply passionate about, like anti-racism work, I've been able to be invited as a speaker to, to numerous other places talking about the same topics or, or going to um, conventions and, and, and sitting as a panelist on those issues, even though it's not what I studied in college or school or anything like that. So it definitely helped. Um, for some of the other speakers that I do know, they will give a single TED Talk and their book will be on the bestsellers list. And so there's, there's definitely a lot of benefits to that platform, even though you can't technically promote yourself on the TED stage, you can't promote a specific product, and they definitely don't pay speakers or anything like that. So there, there, there definitely are benefits to it. Um, and it's just really, really rewarding, really neat to like hear about how like your talk can profoundly impact somebody in, in, in a way that you might not have been expecting. So like um, about two months ago, a teacher in China sent me a video or a, a photograph of their classroom, of all these students learning about anti-racism uh, based on one of the talks I gave, and uh, it was just so incredible. So, um, I mean, and to me that's a very rewarding thing too, probably more so than like any saleable book or anything like that. So, um, when you're there, do you have the opportunity to um, mingle with the other uh, guests? Yeah, it's definitely an incredible networking opportunity, I mean, and you know, what happens is when, as you're kind of in this cohort of speakers going through this process, you, um, you really start to, you, you can talk all the time, you email each other, and then people tend to friend each other on Facebook and promote each other's talks. It's really, uh, really rewarding, very rich networking opportunities. I mean, for me, like in April, I met the writer of the guy who wrote The Land Before Time, and this was like a big dinosaur fan right here. So that, that was the very first movie that I saw in the theaters as a kid, so like, when I met him, I was like, you wrote The Land Before Time, it was incredible. <laughs> and, and so it's, it's a lot of fun, I mean, it, it, and yeah, the, the people that you meet, both in terms of other speakers as well as the planning committee or the attendees, I mean, that they, they never cease to amaze me. They're just a constant source of inspiration. You're going to Washington tomorrow? Yeah, Washington, D.C. And you're making a presentation to whom? Uh, so, it, well, I actually won't be allowed to talk. I'll be in the courtroom. <laughs> um, so my band is in a, a, we're in the case against the, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office who refuses to allow us to register our band's trademark. Um, they say that the slants, um, our band's name, is disparaging the persons of Asian descent. Mm. And so we've been fighting for about five and a half years, um, and it's currently sitting before the federal circuit, which is one step below the Supreme Court. And um, if we are successful, we will be expanding the First Amendment um, and, and revoking a law that's been disproportionately used to suppress the speech of marginalized communities. Um, so it's a, the stakes are pretty high, um, and I, apparently it's going to be quite popular for this hearing. I, I just got tweeted some photos of the university students who are all crashing this oral <laughs> hearing. So, um, this should be interesting. Um, so I won't actually be allowed to speak in court. It'll be like a whole bunch of lawyers arguing with a whole bunch of judges and about this sort of thing. Um, but yeah. Being that there's so much interaction um, with the online community. 
worldwide, and especially when you become somebody who's like a face of any kind of movement, and I think a TED Talk probably puts you in that light. Um, I mean, I imagine you get feedback, probably positive and negative. Like, how do you sift through that? It's true that and certain things that you do in life will kind of put you in the public's eye, and especially with uh, social media, that this ha does happen. I mean, for for my band's trademark case in particular, um, I mean, it's it's quite interesting because it's been in BBC World News, NPR, HBO did a segment on it. Um, like, it's a story that's been shared many times worldwide, and it's it's been fascinating because for me, I kind of live life under a microscope where everything I tweet or write my intentions are being questioned. Like, does he actually hate Asian people? Does he hate white people? I don't know. It's like, I'm like, no, I, you know, I am Asian. I love me some white people. Like, <laughs> so it, it has been fascinating. And because I have done a lot of like anti-racism uh, TED Talks, I am like a white supremacist magnet, it seems, because they email me, they contact me, they find my personal information and, and write some very nasty things. Uh, so that that can certainly be uh, frustrating and then sometimes demoralizing. I mean, you know, receiving threats or that kind of thing. But I try and focus on the actual good that's created. Yeah. I mean, whenever you kind of take a risk by taking a strong stand on anything in life, that 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 tends to happen. And so I just really focus on the positive impact that's being made and and try and, and use that to uh, inspire me to to continue the work. <clears throat> Have you found that there are like avenues of support for people who are in that light receiving social media bullying? I mean, I, you probably didn't have it come up before you were a spotlight, but I wonder if now you have like if there are people who are supportive to you as you deal with that influence. I mean, there there's certainly some some people I could turn to. Usually, trusted friends, and people yeah. that I um, that that I can turn to for for support. I mean, I could always just say, you know what, I'm going to ignore the Google alerts today. I'm not going to look at that tweet stream, I'm not going to look at these Facebook things, and, and I'm just going to unplug a bit and, and focus on surrounding myself with people I care about. Or um, like I'll have saved tweets and emails and, and screenshots of people who have said the most wonderful and profound things, and I use that as my reminder. And uh, like I, I, I will put like little things on the refrigerator or hang them up by my desk and say, remind myself like why I'm doing this. And I, I just use that good to drown out all the bad. And so, I mean, the, the reality is there's overwhelming amounts of good out there. Uh, we just have to sometimes look for it. And, or, you know, it's, it's just those negative comments that really stick out like a sore thumb. Like, someone might say, like, I might have a video, and there might be like 50 really, really good comments, and then there's like one negative one. And I'm like, ah, this was terrible. And the reality is, like, I need to focus on the good. If you're on the way out, you're about to give your summary, and you're going to say, here's the two or three things that will harm you or hurt you the worst in moving forward, and here's the two or three things that will actually move you forward the best, what would you tell them? In, in terms of like submitting it to possible And getting to the place where you're absolutely ready and, and can get on that. Um, number one, it, it's yeah, having an idea that you, you yourself are uniquely able to give. Anybody can give a lecture about any topic, so what makes your idea is special to you. Um, that That's inherently like the, the, kind of the make it or break it thing in terms of giving a TED talk. Um, it's something that also provides value to other people. And I think we undersell ourselves all the time. I think we have these personal stories that are incredibly moving and touching to other people. And uh, we, we, we need to learn how to like immerse ourselves in the world. Yeah, don't leave. Like how, how we're our own worst enemies when yeah, trying to get sure. a TED talk. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, we ramble. I think I, I think like, hey, you know what? I don't know what really is gonna stick, so I'm gonna throw everything at the wall, and I'm gonna write the longest email of my life. Uh, you know, like when submitting a particular talk. The reality is like, so most uh, TEDx events will ask for submission, and they'll they'll say, what's your idea? They they want to know your idea in like a paragraph or less, not like an outline of your entire okay. talk. Mm -hmm. So um, key points, not a book. Yeah, exactly. Keep it keep it concise, like down to the bullet points. What is the most powerful moment? Um, just so I would say, yeah, those are probably the two biggest 
the most important things. Good, is there a point where a TED committee actually listens to everybody's talk and says yay or nay before you do it? Uh, it depends on the event. So um, do you mean like a TEDx independently organized event or like the TED like global the TED. stage? So uh, the TED global stage uh, or TED.com in general, they, they actually do look at the videos that come through the TEDx streams. TEDx are independently organized events. Like there's one at Marrowhurst coming up in February. So if you like what you're hearing tonight and you want to do this kind of thing, definitely support that event. Um, and there are numerous, numerous other events all around the world. Uh, TED, if you want to get a talk onto TED.com, they, they pick from the very best of those TEDx event things and then they put it into the pipeline. Um, so someone does watch it and they have like editor's picks and that sort of thing. But as far as like getting to the TED global stage, uh, that, that's a much more complex um, situation. You can nominate yourself. There's a nomination form on the website. <laughs> um, but I will say this, no person who's nominated themselves in the history of TED has ever gotten to the TED stage. Yes. Um, so Why they, do they offer that option then? I, I don't make you feel good about yourself. Yeah, or maybe, or maybe on maybe for the TED Global, they might they might you might be a person to look out for that sort of thing. But generally speaking, it's kind of like getting a job. It's like who you know, right? It's if, if you're able to make that uh, impact on others in your community, and someone on their selection committee hears about you, or um, you do enough of these TEDx events and they hear about you, you can kind of move yourself through the pipeline. The other way to go about getting to the TED Global stage is every year they have a program called TED Fellows. Uh, they just closed up this window for their recent round about two months ago. But if you look at the end of summer uh, and go to TED's website, you can get on this TED Fellows program. And what this is is like a TED.